My name is Lori Luther, and I am the city manager of Beloit. Welcome to the 18th annual Roy Chapman Andrews Distinguished Explorer Awards Ceremony. On behalf of Council President Regina Duncan, Vice President Clinton Anderson, our full council, and our community at large, it is my honor to welcome you and thank you for attending today's event. This beloved annual presentation is a unique opportunity for the city of Beloit, Beloit College, and our entire community, including students of all ages, to gather together in a very special way. Beloit College President Scott Bierman and I are both fond of saying that the city and the college not only share a name, we share a rich history and undoubtedly a vibrant future. This event allows us to embrace both our heritage and the possibilities that lie ahead. We are fortunate to be the birthplace of the brilliant Roy Chapman Andrews, and this event helps memorialize his scientific contributions to the world. Each year I have thought the society could not possibly outdo itself with the caliber of scientists and explorers who are recognized each year, and yet they manage to do so. Tonight will be no different. Thank you again for joining us in this year's celebration of Beloit's rich history and the advance, advancement of scientific discoveries across the globe. At this time, I would like to introduce the president of the Roy Chapman Andrews Society, Joe, Joe Sodelman. Good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's great to see a full house. It's my uh, honor on behalf of the entire Roy Chapman Andrews Society board to welcome you tonight. Since 1999, the society has worked to honor the legacy of Roy Chapman Andrews, to honor his boyhood home of Beloit, and to educate the public about his life and his scientific explorations. I would like to first start off with a few acknowledgments and thank yous. And, and first and foremost to our recipient this year, Dr. Shubin, thank you very much for a wonderful speech this morning to about 1,100 high school age kids from all over the Beloit area. We really appreciate the energy you brought. As a membership driven organization, our membership is what makes us work. And so if you're not a member, we'd invite you to join us at RoyChapmanAndrewsSociety.org. If you are a member, thank you so much for your support for us every year. This is the event we do. This is our signature. It is celebrating what we call Beloit Original, Roy Chapman Andrews, and our, our world here in Beloit. This is a unique, unique event that not many communities throughout the country can say they do, and Beloit does this every year, year in and year out. It's because of our sponsors that we can do that. And I'd like to just acknowledge those sponsors today, um, starting with ABC Supply, Amy Lowkrantz, Angus Young Associates, Beloit College, Best Events, Blackhawk Bank, Comerica, First National Bank, Ironworks Hotel, the Nice Family Foundation, Resonate Web Marketing, School District of Beloit, the State Line Community Foundation, and finally Visit Beloit. Would you please give those all a round of applause? <laughs> One of our priorities throughout this event is to engage our high school students in a different way so that they get a real experience of the scientific exploration. They hear from our recipients about their, their adventures, their, their work, and this year is no different. And we have a number of high school sponsors. These, these sponsors are sponsoring a table of seven students and one teacher at our celebratory dinner after this event. And I want to acknowledge and thank them for their, their support. That is Larry and Karen Arft, Jim and Helen Olson, Tom and Mim Warren, John and Becky Wong, the Nice Family Foundation, the State Line Community Foundation, and Visit Beloit. Once again, will you give me a round of applause for them? And finally, if I could ask all the members of the Roy Chapman Andrew Society Board to stand at this time. This is the, these are the people that work year round to make this event 
such a special day for everybody here in Beloit. And please, if, if everyone could rise and uh, take a round of applause. Most of them are either in the back of the room or already over at the Science Center getting ready for the dinner. Um, so uh, lastly, I need to acknowledge one person who really is the glue of our society, who, who makes everything that we do hold together, and that's Ruth Carlson, our executive director. <laughs> she plans out every, every minute of, of the yesterday and today to make sure that this is such a special experience for all of us, and she does such a great job. So finally, I'd like to introduce Ann Bossom, a society board member, past board member, an author, and a Roy Chapman Andrews historian to the, to the podium for uh, a little update about Roy. Ann? Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Joe. It's always my pleasure to share a few minutes of history with you ahead of this, the lectures that we have here annually. And I thought I would preview what is surely going to be one of the day's prominent themes by suggesting that we do a bit of time traveling for a few minutes. I can't take you back through epochs and eons. That's the job of our distinguished guest. But I can take you back one century, and with very good reason. So let's go back to 1919, because that was a very important year. Not only did the troops come home from the First World War, not only did Curly Lambeau help to organize what would become the Green Bay Packers, and I realize that that may be the most important event of the list, <laughs> but for hometown fans of Roy Chapman Andrews, 1919 was also important because that was the first year he conducted field work in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. So think of that, field work in the Gobi. And if you're conjuring up images of Andrews crossing the desert with a fleet of Dodge cars in the company of a train of camels, you must clear your mind. That travel came later. 1919 was simpler. 1919 was the basics. It was the beginning. It was the very first glimmer of what would follow. It was a man on a horse, that would be Roy, a woman on a horse, we're talking here about his wife, Yvette, a few oxen pulling carts, and several assistants. That was it. For most of the summer, the couple sized up the countryside, documented it with photographs, collected zoological specimens, and for good measure, defended themselves from man-eating dogs. Andrews had wanted to explore Mongolia with Yvette after crossing the Gobi the year before in 1918 while on some sort of military espionage mission that he remained cagey about for the rest of his life. He was smitten with the place at first sight. I had found my country, he later wrote, the one I had bo been born to know and love. Andrews would love that landscape, its people, and the mysteries it revealed for five more expeditions the ones with the camels and the cars, and he would treasure his memories of Mongolia for the duration. As you may recall, I do give this lesson periodically, Andrews was not an archeologist, that was Indiana Jones. Nor was he a paleontologist, although many people think of him as one because of the spectacular paleontological discoveries that his teams of scientists went on to make during those expeditions in the 20s. Andrews was, in fact, a zoologist by training, having been born in Beloit in 1884 and having grown up during an era when it made perfect sense for a young boy to wander around the surrounding countryside toting a shotgun and a naturalist's notebook. Andrews had taken that love of exploration with him to New York City in 1906, along with his brand new Beloit College degree, and he used it to talk his way into a job at the American Museum of Natural History. Some dozen years later, he used these same persuasive abilities and his experiences in Mongolia to convince his boss to let him return there for more extensive exploration. It had been a bit of a tough sell. Andrews wanted to look for evidence of early human life in the Gobi, a place where next to no fossils had ever been found. 
Plenty of skeptics said he couldn't have chosen a less likely place to find signs of ancient life, although the barren reaches of Alaska might have come to mind as an equally foolish place to explore. But Andrews went on to prove the Gobi skeptics wrong, just as present company would do for those who doubted the potential for discovery in the far north. He remained confident throughout his career, as we inscribe on every award, that the world is still full of corners. He expounded on his philosophy of exploration when he wrote On the Trail of Ancient Man, which was published in 1926, and I quote, we stand on the threshold of a new era of scientific exploration, which is just as romantic, just as alluring, and just as adventurous as that of Perry and Amundsen, of Stanley and Haden. In almost every country of the earth lie vast regions which potentially are unknown. Some of them are charted poorly, if at all, and many hold undreamed of treasures in the realm of science to study these little known areas, to reveal the history of their making, and interpret that history to the world of today, to learn what they can give in education, culture, and for human welfare, that is the exploration of the future. And so it was for Andrews, and arguably still is. Over the next dozen years, he proved the validity of this vision by leading multiple interdisciplinary expeditions into the Gobi and by pulling secrets out of the desert that continue to instruct and inform our understanding of the past. This continuum of study and exploration is alive and well as we will learn today, proving that even now the world is still full of corners. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce Carl Mendelssohn, Emeritus Professor of Geology, who will provide perspective on this year's recipient of the Roy Chapman Andrews Society Distinguished Explorer Award. Uh, thank you very much, Anne. I am deeply honored to introduce our awardee and to relate a bit about his many accomplishments as a scientist and as an explorer. Neil Shubin earned his bachelor's in biology and anthropology at Columbia University in New York, which is just two miles from the American Museum of Natural History, where he volunteered during his college years. As Anne just mentioned, Roy Chapman Andrews managed to land a job at the American Museum in 1906, and by 1934, he had become its director. And Andrews also has a connection with Columbia, that's where he earned a master's in zoology. Shubin went on to earn his PhD in organismal and evolutionary biology at Harvard University in 1987. After a postdoctoral appointment at the University of California, Berkeley, and a decade as a faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania, Shubin secured his current position at the University of Chicago in the Department of Organismal Biology and Anatomy. Currently, he is the Robert R. Bensley Distinguished Service Professor of Anatomy and holds many other responsibilities and titles at the University of Chicago. In addition, he is a research associate in the Department of Geology at the Field Museum of Natural History. As a paleontologist, Dr. Schubert has scoured rocks for the bones that document over 500 million years of vertebrate evolution. He has studied fossils of nearly all kinds of vertebrates, including frogs, salamanders, lizards, crocodiles, flying reptiles, dinosaurs, mammals, and fish of all types, including those that have yielded clues to understanding the transition of backboned animals from the water to the land. Fossil-rich rocks are not distributed evenly across our planet, requiring Shubin to explore all over the world, including sites in China, Morocco, Argentina, Greenland, the United States, Nova Scotia and the Arctic islands of Canada, and most recently, Antarctica. Roy Chapman Andrews once wrote, I wanted to go everywhere. I would have started on a day's notice for the North Pole or the South, to the jungle or the desert. It made not the slightest difference to me. Our speaker has been equally motivated by exploration. In his book, Your Inner Fish, Shubin writes, with each new fossil find, we discover answers to old questions and are challenged to pose new, more refined ones. That is the thrill of the hunt. 
Throughout his remarkable career, Neil Shubin has maintained an enviable presence in the scientific community. His papers have appeared in a variety of scholarly publications, including Science and Nature, the most prestigious scientific journals in the world. He has also published less technical overviews of his research and ideas in two important books, Your Inner Fish, published in 2008, which has been transformed into a three-part PBS video series, and The Universe Within, which was published in 2013. Professor Shubin has earned important honors and awards, which are too many to recount here, but I'll mention just a few. As a graduate student at Harvard and as a young faculty member at Penn, he earned teaching awards. Your Inner Fish has garnered a number of accolades for science communication. In 2011, Shubin was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. In 2014, the National Center for Science Education honored him with the Friend of Darwin Award. And in 2016, Yale's Peabody Museum presented him with the coveted Verrill Medal, which recognizes, and I quote, a signal practitioner in the arts of natural history and natural science. ABC News named Neil Shubin a Person of the Week in 2006. And finally, he has been a guest twice on the Colbert Report. <laughs> now, an appearance on that show is a distinction shared with seven of our past distinguished explorers. And I'm not sure what that means, but <laughs> perhaps it means that our explorers are very articulate and they have a healthy sense of humor. Dr. Shubin's remarkable career has been based on a skillful and intentional integration of an impressive array of scientific disciplines, including anatomy, developmental biology, molecular biology, genetics, geology, and of course, vertebrate paleontology and evolution. In order to properly recognize excellence in these fields, as well as in exploration and science outreach, the Roy Chapman Andrews Society has chosen Dr. Neil Shubin as the 2019 recipient, recipient of the Distinguished Explorer Award. It is now time for the presentation of that award by noted author and Andrews biographer, Ann Bossom, and by Joe Stottleman, president of the Roy Chapman Andrews Society. Dr. Shubin, would you please come forward? Neil Shubin, evolutionary biologist, paleontologist, comparative anatomist, science communicator. As a college student, you were inspired by the displays, collections, and scientific discourse at the American Museum of Natural History. Eventually, you led your own fossil hunting expeditions, one of which exhumed Tiktaalik rosea, your fish with feet. Using comparative anatomy, genetics, and developmental biology, you crafted a comparative story of evolution that invites humans to embrace their inner fish. Both you and Roy Chapman Andrews explored arid environments where rocks and the fossils they contain are well exposed. Andrew, Andrews traveled to the Mongolian Gobi <clears throat> Desert via caravan of cars and camels, whereas you arrived by helicopter to the Canadian <laughs> Arctic. Both teams worried about being marooned by bad weather. Andrews feared attack by bandits. You feared being eaten by polar bears. <laughs> you and Andrews share the exploratory itch to find the next adventure just around the corner, but both of you recognized the need to temper that <clears throat> urge by seeking out team members with the patience to mine sites for their riches. Like Andrews, your writings have resonated with professionals and laypersons and with young and old. In appreciation for these contributions, we are pleased to bestow upon you the honor of Distinguished Explorer from the Roy Chapman Andrews Society this 26th day of April, 2019 in Beloit, Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. All right, let's see. Get out of your way. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it is just such a delight to be here and to be honored in this way. <clears throat> because honestly, you know, I'm only here because of people like Roy Chapman Andrews and Roy Chapman Andrews himself. There's an explorer. There's somebody who is pushing the forefront of human knowledge. And that is what we aspire to do in every lab, in every field expedition. All of us in science are working to expand the frontier of what we know about our world, about our universe. That's a remarkable privilege to be in. And we're following in the footsteps of people like him, of Roy Chapman Andrews, who really ventured into the unknown, took risks, put himself on the line, and in so doing, really changed the way we think about the world and we think about ourselves. So thank you. I'm so delighted to be affiliated uh, with uh, this institution of the Roy Chapman Andrews Society, as well as Roy Chapman Andrews uh, himself. Now, my whole entree into this field of, of science and discussing of your inner fish really began about 20 years ago. I mean, there are many beginnings, obviously, but your inner fish and many of the, the tools we're going to talk about tonight began when I moved to Chicago. I moved to Chicago in the year 2000, and I came as chairman of the anatomy department in the medical school. And my primary teaching responsibility in the medical school was the human anatomy course for first-year physicians. Now, this is the gross anatomy course. And it is an amazing course to teach. It's what they take the first year in, in, in medical school. And it's an enormously stressful experience. You know, they're, they're memorizing tens of thousands of new names. They're encountering the structure of the human body and all its beauty and all its elegance and all its complexity. It's very stressful in a lot of ways, not the least of which is they're confronting their own mortality. I mean, we have you know, 30 cadavers in the room that we're dissecting. And so to sort of like chill the whole atmosphere, what I'd do as the course director is I'd hang out with the students over the lab during the dissections, and we'd, you know, we'd talk. We'd kind of get to know each other. I'd let them get to know me, and I'd get to know them. Almost invariably, the students would ask, within the first weeks of the class, they'd say, hey, Dr. Shubin, what kind of doctor are you? You know, are you, are you a cardiologist? Are you a neurosurgeon? What was it? I said, well, no, I'm a fish paleontologist. <laughs> Whoa, I want my money back. <laughs> um, but it soon became clear that being a paleontologist, and not just any paleontologist, a fish paleontologist, is a powerful way to teach and learn human anatomy. Why? Because often many of the best roadmaps to our own bodies lie in other creatures. The best roadmaps to the complex tangle of nerves inside our head, the famous cranial nerves. Oh, you'll see them in sharks. Best way to teach it. Best way to think about the basic structure of our brain, its basic organization, lie in creatures like reptiles and things like that. And the reason why this is true is because in every organ, every tissue, every cell, every piece of DNA in our bodies, we contain artifacts of over four billion years of the history of life. And how do we know this? We know this through expeditions. We know this through finding fossils around the world. We know this by comparing DNA. We know it from our labs. We know it from the expeditions. Another entree to this field came when I was a student. And this is, this is really when I began thinking about expeditions. I was a second year PhD student. And I was really struggling. I wasn't the best student. And I was really struggling with one thing. I was struggling with trying to find a PhD dissertation topic, something to work on. I couldn't do it. So I took a course, which was on the greatest hits of evolution, taught by a leader in the field. And in one of the early weeks of the class, he showed this exact slide, and my life was changed. That. <laughs> I'm easy to change. But that was really great. This was a cartoon shown like in the 1980s of what we knew at the time, you know, it's in rough sort of cartoon form, of the transition from fish to land living animal. What you see on top is a fish. It's a cartoon of a fossil creature from rocks about 390 million years old. And it looks like, you know, any good old fish, right? It's got a conical head. It's got no neck. It has fins, lots of them, fish. What you see on the bottom is a cartoon of one of the earliest limbed animals to walk on land. 
It's a cartoon of a fossil known from Greenland, a creature uh, that lived about 365 million years ago. It was found in rocks that old. And you can see it you know, has a flat head with eyes on top. It has a neck. It has limbs with fingers and toes. I remember looking at this slide and saying to myself, this is a first class scientific problem. How did fish have about to walk on land? How could that ever happen? Right? Because if you look at the endpoints, the fish and the limbed animal, it looks so utterly impossible. Everything's different, right? Fish live in water, land living animals live on uh, land, you know, so it's big differences. So I was training to be a paleontologist at the time, thinking about expeditions, and so I set off, my goal, literally, at that time, began to think about, let's find an intermediate. Let's find something maybe that has like a flat head, like a limbed animal, with fins maybe with limb bones inside. Something that's truly a mix between the flat-headed thing on top with uh, limbs and the, and the conical-headed things with fins on top. That's literally what started it. I wanted to find an intermediate. So what did I do? I used the toolbox that paleontologists have been using for a century or more before I entered the field. And Roy Chapman Andrews and the teams he brought out with him were using those tools as well. And I'll give them to you now. And they're basically, in principle, they're exactly what paleontologists use to design new expeditions. These three parameters. Think about it. The world's a big place. The places we find fossils are really small. So how do you know where to look? Here's what you do. You look for places in the world that have three things. You look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age to answer whatever question interests you. Remember I told you, right? The fossil on top's 390, the limbed animal on the bottom's 365 million years old. So we want to be in that window of time. That's the time period we know of as the late Devonian. Okay? So I knew that, and it's a little more refined than that, as you'll hear about in a few minutes. But rocks are the right age. If I was working on the origin of dinosaurs, I'd be looking at rocks about 220 million years old. Right? So different problems have different ages. We know that as geologists and scientists. So boom, you got that. The next thing is you look for places in the world that have rocks of the right type to hold fossils. Not every kind of rock will hold a fossil, right? I mean, some of them are volcanic, igneous, like in Hawaii. They're not going to hold fossils. That's superheated. Anything in, there would be nothing in there. Um, metamorphic rocks tend not to hold fossils, right? They've been highly pressurized. There are exceptions, but they're highly pressurized, high, superheated. You're not going to find great fossils in those. You look for sedimentary rocks formed, in this case, in ancient rivers, streams, and oceans. We look for that geological signature, okay? Rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type. You're getting my whole toolkit here so you can compete with me now. Um, and the third thing is, it does me no good if my wonderful rocks of the right age and the right type are preserved 10 miles underground, right? They have to be preserved at the surface. They have to be exposed at the surface. So it's really exposures are a very big thing. I need those rocks so I can see them. So that's it. We look for places in the world that have rocks the right age, rocks of the right type, rocks that are exposed and accessible, and off we go. That's what I spend my time doing looking at. That's the toolkit. There is a fourth variable that I, as a young scientist, didn't realize at the time, but I became acutely aware, and that's money, or in my case, lack of it, because <laughs> I didn't have much. And so I, um, the story is, the way this all began is I took my first academic job in, at the University of Pennsylvania in the southeastern corner of the state of Pennsylvania. You can see the map here. And what I wanted was a field project I could do on the cheap, right? I didn't want to lead these huge expeditions around the world. I couldn't afford it, and I couldn't take the risk. So I wanted something, I, you know, that I could do on turnpike tolls and gas money from my station wagon, right? So I pulled out, looking for rocks of the right age, I pulled out a geological map of the state of Pennsylvania. This is in the um, early 1990s. And I'm showing you this map of the state of Pennsylvania stripped of everything unimportant. Ha ha, Devonian, right? And so what you see is, in purple, across the state of Pennsylvania are what? Devonian age rocks. Remember I told you the right age is more or less 390, 365. Devonian. So it was very clear when I pulled this map out, I had, within three hours from my home in Philly, I had Devonian age rocks that were mapped by the Pennsylvania State Geological Survey. So far so good, right, huh? That's excellent. Now when I think about the rocks, are the rocks the right type? If you want to think about what Pennsylvania looked like 365 million years ago, get Philadelphia, get Harrisburg, and get Pittsburgh out of your brain and think, Amazon Delta. Here's a reconstruction of what Pennsylvania looked like 365 million years ago, done by the Pennsylvania State Geological Survey. You ready? 
boom, that's it, Amazon Delta. Because the rocks are a package of these things that are formed in ancient rivers and streams and inland seas, and they have a certain pattern to them. So what you had in Pennsylvania at this time is you had a series of highlands to the east, and in kind of where Scranton and, and, and Wilkes-Barre are today, you had an inland sea called the Catskill Sea to the west, more or less where Pittsburgh and Cleveland are today. So those are marine Devonian shales you'll find out in there. And draining, extending from east to west across the state of Pennsylvania were rivers and streams of, of formed in ancient delta systems. Now, if you're a paleontologist interested in finding a crater right at the cusp of the transition from life in water to life on land, perfecto. Why? Because if you have the exposures, you can sample ancient seas, inland seas, you could sample ancient estuaries, you can work upstream, you can look at ancient lakes, you got all the relevant environments that these creatures likely lived in. So here I had rocks of the right age and rocks of the right type, you know, within three hours of my uh, house uh, in Philadelphia. There's one big problem. Pennsylvania is not a desert. I'm sure the re residents are very happy with that, but as a paleontologist, I was less than delighted by that fact because Pennsylvania is not known for its exposures of rock, like the Gobi Desert or other places I'll show you today. Um, basically, all the exposures of Devonian rocks that I was working on were those that were made by the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation when they built new roads. <laughs> when, when PennDOT would make a new road or widen a road, what they would do is, what would they do? They'd dynamite, right? They'd blow up stuff. They'd make a bend in a road, they'd blow up rock. Occasionally, they'd be blowing up rock in places where there was mapped Devonian. So my colleague and former student, Ted Deschler, who's been a big part of all this, and I used to follow PennDOT around as they made new roads. Now, one of the areas that was um, really important in the early days, and this is the early 1990s, was this. It's a big red hill in Pennsylvania. We called it Red Hill. Um, we're not clever with our names. Um, but what you could see is here's our station wagons. There's a human being for scale right there. You could see the red strata. These are the layers of Devonian Age rocks. We're on State Route 120, about an hour and a half north of State College, Pennsylvania, the center part of the state. What you're seeing here is a cross section of an ancient delta system. These layers, ancient rivers. You'd look at them in cross section, you'd see they're sort of lenticular in shape with cobbles on the inside and fine grain sands on the outside. You're seeing a cross section of an ancient delta system. It's very beautiful. But what's also more beautiful about this is kind of where this gentleman is right here. So we climbed all over these hills, all over these hills. I spent you know, a year climbing all over them. Um, and then right there, we started to find fossils. This is in the early 90s. The first things we started to find were teeth, the size of railroad spikes. Lots of them, like hundreds of these things. They were not rare. Then we started to find jaws of these animals. Jaws the length of your arm. Okay, here's Ted holding one of those jaws. He's just holding the front end. But imagine this, you have jaws the length of your arm, teeth the size of railroad spikes, and these are coming out of this roadside in Pennsylvania. I mean, trucks are honking to us, but we're pulling out these gi giant monsters from, from Pennsylvania. We also started to pull out other fish. This, this will look like a roadkill to you, a Devonian roadkill. It's beautiful to me. Um, there's its head on the right, its body on the left. This is a lobe fin fish, beautiful fish it really is, trust me. Then, what we started to find almost, um, and from the first days up there, within a few weeks, I should say, was we started to find limb bones of some of the earliest animals to walk on land. We found upper arm bones. This is a humerus of an early limbed animal. It looks identical to one that, you know, that cartoon I've been showing you, that critter from Greenland, the flat-headed animal? It looks identical to one of the, its, its bones. Um, we started to find leg bones, shoulder bones, skull bones. We started to find some of the earliest creatures to walk on land along the roadsides of Pennsylvania in rocks 365 million years old, along with giant fish the size of, you know, with teeth the size of railroad spikes and lots of other things. So then Ted and I worked with National Geographic in the mid-1990s to do a reconstruction of what this area looked like 365 million years ago. So that roadside in Pennsylvania, that's, what, that's the reconstruction, as best we can tell from the geology and the fossils. What you have are some of the earliest trees. We're finding those as fossils. We find some shrubs along the banks of these streams. And then we have these freshwater streams 
in Pennsylvania in the Devonian, and it's called the Catskill Formation. And you can see it's loaded with life. We have that big fish. This is the fish with the teeth the size of railroad spikes and the jaws as long as your arm. We had lots of little armored fish. Good thing they had armor because you had this big thing swimming around. And then we had all kinds of limbed animals, lots of different species. We have, and we draw them here, all kinds of different limbed animals. This is great. But Ted and I realized in the mid-1990s, we had a really big problem, a really big problem. We were already finding really advanced limbed animals in rocks 365 million years ago. Looking at the literature and thinking about the evolution of these things, it became very clear we were in rocks that were too young to answer the question that we're interested in. We needed to go back about 10 million years to rocks, that, not 365, but back to about 375 or 380 million years old, to a time period in the Devonian called the Franian. That'll make sense to you very shortly. So we realized we had a problem. We're not going to find our intermediate in these rocks. It's too young. We had to go back in time. I wanted to find a flat-headed fish with fins, and I, we weren't doing it here. So this is what motivated it all, right? We were finding a lot of these creatures here. Let's look at the differences. I already talked a little bit, but let's just work through it. Some of them. You could go through a lot of them. Look at the critter on top. That's that fossil fish that's 390 million years old. Look at it. It has a conical head with, with eyes on either side. If you look at the earliest limbed animals, it has a flat head with eyes on top. This fish on top does also has a head that's connected to its shoulder by a series of plate-like bones. It doesn't have a neck. When it wants to move around, what does it do? It just swims around in three-dimensional space. Whereas early limbed animals, like you and me and everything that walks on land with a backbone, has a neck where the head can swivel independently of the body. They lost, we've lost the connection between the shoulder and the head, and no plates connect it. And there's also swivel joints between them, so there's a neck. The other thing that's really important, and it appears around the same time as a neck in the fossil record, is the transformation of limbs, uh, of, of fins into limbs. That is, fins have fin rays, whereas the earliest limbs have limb bones with fingers and toes and wrists and ankles and arm bones and forearm bones and all that stuff, and you're not seeing that in fish. Ted and I were finding a lot of fingers and toes and wrists and ankles. We were finding necks. We were finding this stuff. We weren't finding a flat-headed fish with fins, with arm bones inside, with lungs and gills. We, we weren't doing it. So we had to move back about 10, 15 million years. So we had a plan. So back to the drawing board. Literally back to the drawing board in the mid-1990s. Uh, looking for places in the world that had rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type, rocks that are exposed to the surface. You're getting the idea of how we work. And we had an idea to work in Brazil. Uh, we had an idea to work um, in uh, Montana. Everything changed one day in my office. Um, Ted and I had an argument. We were having an argument over some minutia of geology. I don't remember what the topic was, but to end the argument, I pulled out my college geology textbook. I kid you not. Pulled out the textbook, this is it, by Dot and Betton. Uh, Robert Dot was a longtime professor uh, in Madison. This is Evolution of the Earth. This is its second edition, a version of which I, I used. Um, settled the debate, no problem there. And then Ted and I are chewing the fat after the debate. You know, it was done. We're all we're friends. And I, I'm just turning my pages through the book. I found another diagram that was to change my life. And this is it. I have to show it to you because it's kind of exactly what we look for as paleontologists. I literally stopped at this diagram and said, I didn't believe what I saw. It was truly amazing. This is it, OK? This is what you look for when you're a paleontologist, if you want to find an intermediate, if you're looking for places in the world that might have the right rocks. This is a diagram from that textbook, and I colorized it a little bit, but it says upper Devonian sedimentary facies. That means sedimentary rocks, the right kinds generally rock, of the time period upper Devonian. So right there. Look at this. It's a map of North America. You can see Central America on the bottom. Superimposed on that map is an interpretation of the environments that these ancient Devonian rocks formed in. Okay? So that's what you're seeing. So the interpretation here is in the western part of North America, you have marine rocks. It was an ancient Devonian ocean, just mapped by the sediments there, the shales. But these authors identified three areas, I'm showing them in red here, that were formed as ancient delta systems that had ancient rivers and streams. First one, looked at that, been there, done that, right? That's the Catskill Formation. That's the stuff with the teeth the size of railroad spikes, jaws as long as your arm, the, the, the limbed animals that we were finding. I already talked to you about that. There's another one. Been there, done that too, East Greenland. Right? That's, remember I showed you the cartoon of the limbed animal in rocks about 365 million years old? That was discovered in the 1920s and 1930s um, by Danish and Swedish teams working together in East Greenland. 
Uh, we knew about that. I think you see where I'm going, right? Ex <laughs> extending 1,500 kilometers across the Canadian Arctic, across a series of islands, were a series of rocks that were formed in ancient delta systems um, from the right, from the Franian age, the right age. I looked at Ted, it's literally, this, I mean, there's, I had a little, he had a little uh, bibliography next to the diagram. I looked at Ted, do you know anybody who's worked on these rocks before? He says, I don't know that. Did you know anybody? I said, I asked you that question. Back and forth, we go like this. Nobody's worked on these rocks. So we ran to the library. This is the mid-1990s, late 19, 1997. Now, libraries, you might remember, are things that had these things with paper called books, and you would cut your fingers on them and stuff like that. But anyway, so we, we went there because the journals were there with all the maps and stuff like that. And we found that morning, this all happened in the morning. I can't, it was like, wow. Um, we found papers by this guy, another Indiana, uh, another uh, Roy Chapman Andrews type, Ashton Embry. Ashton Embry had the world's coolest job in the 60s and 70s. He was hired by the Geological Survey of Canada to map the rocks in the Canadian Arctic. And his job was incredible, just the basic geology. He was literally dropped off in the Canadian Arctic with an Inuit helper and a sledge. And his geological tools, a Brunton compass, a rock hammer, a Jacob staff, knapsacks, notebooks, pens, that sort of stuff. And literally, he'd spend about four weeks each summer mapping the rocks in particular areas. And he produced elegant maps of what kinds of rocks, of what ages are likely present across the Canadian Arctic. And so they drop, think about this, they drop them off with a sledge and dogs and an Inuit helper um, and a colleague. And uh, you know, they'd, they'd leave them canned food and they'd take off. And hopefully they left him a can opener. They'd pick him up about a month later and he would have produced these beautiful maps. He produced an amazing paper, and I'm going to show you that paper. And you're going to look at this and you say, why is this guy showing me this paper? There's a reason. He produced this paper, and this is the paper that launched it all. It's in the Canadian Petroleum Geology, um, Bulletin of the Canadian Petroleum Geology. It's called the Middle Upper Devonian Clastic Wedge of the Franklinian Geosyncline. You know, you know, it's not going to be a movie, it's not going to be a television show, nothing like that. But it is more interesting and more fascinating and, to me, more important in so many ways. Because when people ask me, you know, how, Neil, how do you know where to look? How do you know how to find fossils? I say, well, look at page 548 of Embry and Clovan, all right? When he says, um, when he says you know, what are the ages of these rocks in uh, the Canadian Arctic? He says, the available data indicate an age of what? Early to middle Franian. Remember I told you we needed to be in the Franian rocks about 375 million years old? That's what this is. Rocks, bam, of exactly the right age. Now he's talking about this formation of rocks. He named it the Fram Formation, F-R-A-M. It's named after a famous Norwegian um, vessel, exploration vessel. He's, you know, and Ted and I were working in the Catskill Formation, finding all kinds of fossils. We're wondering, is what's the Fram Formation like? When he talks about the Fram Formation, uh, Ashton Embry said, the Fram Formation is similar to the Catskill Formation in Pennsylvania, right? Ted and I were pulling thousands of fossils out of here. Here we had rocks exactly like the Catskill Formation, only of the right age. And then Ashton showed some pictures of these perfect exposures. We couldn't get there soon enough. This all happened in one morning in 1997 in my office in Philadelphia. By that time, we were so hungry. We were in the library all morning. We had to go to Chinese food for lunch. And so I had my, you know, my hot and sour soup or whatever I had, and I had a fortune cookie. Yeah, I kid you not. The fortune cookie has moved with me from Philadelphia to Chicago. I kind of told my door in Chicago. It said, soon you'll be sitting on top of the world. <laughs> I kid you not. I looked at Ted. We are so out of here. Now, I, um, <laughs> I am, I'm, a, I'm a man who has few regrets in life, but I do regret never playing these lucky numbers. <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway, so um, um, from Ashton's um, paper, we were able to extract some really key details for launching the expeditions I'm going to tell you about. So um, you know, we're up here in Nunavut Territory, which is the northern part of Canada. There's the North Pole. Uh, so we're about 600 or 700 miles from the North Pole. And you, know, you can see the Canadian Arctic is loaded with these different islands. These are the islands, just zoom in on the center part of this. These are the islands, uh, the Canadian High Arctic. You have Ellesmere Island here. You have uh, Melville Island, Bathurst Island. But what you'll see immediately is everything circled in red here are the Devonian exposures that um, Ashton mapped. It's just amazing, right? And then look at the scale. It's 100 kilometers. So it's vast. You know, just an enormous amount. And now we faced a new problem, which was, you know, how to narrow it down. And there's the Fromm formation in a stratigraphic diagram. It's perfect. So now I had new problems. Now how do you work in the Arctic? I didn't know anything about working in the Arctic. I was working out of my um, 
station wagon in Pennsylvania. So now I had a whole new problem, right? I had to work up here. A lot of big differences, right? So we're, you know, it's daylight 24 hours a day in the summer. It's uh, nighttime 24 hours a day in the winter. Um, there are, as you heard, there are polar bears up there. Uh, polar bears eat people. That was always on my mind, has always been on my mind. I don't want that uh, for anybody, <laughs> at least <laughs> nobody. Um, and it's also very remote, right? So we're about 300 miles from the nearest human settlement. The nearest human settlement is a town called Greasefjord, Canada, one of the northernmost communities in the entire world. It has 175 Inuit who live there year round. Okay, and this is a picture of the big city um, 300 miles from us uh, in spring. Right, so that's kind of, so we're, we're really kind of a logistic extreme here. So the way we get camp set up uh, is through um, aircraft, as you heard, uh, helicopters and twin otter aircraft. So we're beyond the tank of gas of a helicopter. So a lot of what we have to do is get fuel and get food to the remote sites. So these planes here, these twin otter planes, um, are flown by some of the best pilots in the world. The Canadian pilots who fly these things, twin otters, are remarkable pilots, remarkable people too. These planes uh, have a stall speed of 54, 55 miles an hour. It means in a headwind, they can do almost anything, almost vertical takeoff and landing, but they can land right on the tundra. So they can bring uh, fuel out, and then we can uh, leapfrog with the helicopters to our sites. What this means is, the reason why I'm showing you all this is, we're so dependent on aircraft, we can't take a whole lot of stuff with us, and importantly, we can't take a whole lot of stuff home. Fossils are rocks, fossils are heavy. These things cannot carry a lot of weight. So we're always making judgment calls in the field about what comes with us and what, and, uh, what stays. We also can't bring a lot. I bring a very small crew. I don't bring a ton of people. Um, so this is what camp looks like before we set it up. You know, we only take about five to seven people. The food goes in these uh, white tubs. There's a reason for that. They seal up real tight. Polar bears are all out there. They have good noses, so we try to run a very clean camp. We usually take a youth or two from the local Inuit village um, to work with us. It's been a real delight. So, it's a, you know, so basically, weights are, are very important for us. So how did we do this? Well, we had the fortune cookie in 1997, and it took us uh, about two years to raise money, get funds, get um, permits to work in the Arctic. So in 1999, we started. We were going to do it. We're all psyched. Uh, we went to the western part of the Arctic. This is what camp looked like in 1999. Each of us had our own personal mountaineering tent. When you build a wind wall around them, they can withstand 80 mile an hour winds. They're truly remarkable. Um, this was our um, kitchen tent the first year, this canvas thing. Um, it can withstand winds of about 35 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, you get it. So I spent the first summer up there chasing this thing all around the tundra. But, um, but we camp adjacent to these um, permanent snow fields, and you can drink the water melting right out of them. You know, I don't carry often a water bottle. I carry a mug, which is really remarkable. But what you can see here is these, these are, at least in the western part of the Arctic, it's very low-lying. And so this is all the Devonian rock. So what we do is we'd wake up each morning, and we'd literally make quadrants, you know, over 20, 30, 40 miles of this stuff, and walk back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, looking at the surface for where bones would weather out of the rocks. So what you have here is you have a kind of freeze-thaw. In the winter there, it's really, really cold. In the summer there, it's less really, really cold. So you have this thing where you go from really, really cold to less really, really cold. But what that does is it breaks up the top layer, and sometimes the bones are really hard and they'll get spit out. So if you're lucky, you can find bones. Um, and we did. We found lots of bones all throughout there. There weren't the greatest exposures in the world, but we started to find bones, but we had a problem. We were in the middle of an ancient ocean. We were finding deep water fish, sharks, and things like that. Nothing that would be walking on land. We're in the middle of the ocean. Something was wrong with the geology. So we were in the middle of the sea. Let me show you the Pennsylvania piece here. So we were in the middle of the sea. What we needed to do was go upstream. We needed to get into the estuaries or even further up into the streams, geologically. And so what that meant is in looking at the maps to go back, we had a change plan altogether, and we had to go further east. So east in this case meant we're going from the ancient ocean in the Devonian to rocks that would be of the ancient streams and rivers. Boom, this is perfect. Because as soon as we did that, number one, we got a new kitchen tent, so I didn't have to chase it into the fjord. Um, number two, you can see everything's a little more um, montane. Now these aren't like scary mountains to climb up. Um, you, can, you can actually go up and down them, no problem. Um, but these are ancient rivers and streams, much like the Catskill Formation. So we started to get into that stuff. And as soon as we did that, we got into fish that were more like lobe fin fish, more like kind of in the game of the kind of thing we were looking for. This is in the second, uh, second year. But we still weren't finding much. We were finding bits and pieces of bones. We needed to go back. We needed to hit it harder. We weren't there yet. So we worked for a few more years 
to try to find a valley that would have more gentle deposition, where the fossils wouldn't be broken apart. And everything changed one day. We found that valley. And this is arguably the most special slide I'm going to show you all night. I know, it's crazy. And the reason why it's special is because of this blue pixel right here, that blue pixel. That blue pixel is young Jason Downs. So what happened here is Jason was a college student who joined us for the expedition. You know, he walked up to me and he says, my name's Jason Downs and I want to be a paleontologist. And he worked in my lab for about a year and a half. He was talented as all get out. Decided to bring him up to the, to the, to the field. So Ted, just by coincidence, took this picture. He just finished lunch. And he kind of liked this view, so he just snapped this view, and he caught Jason in the middle of the view, who just finished his own lunch, and he was about to walk off the slide. Now, we didn't know this at the time. I was not around. I was in another part of the valley here, up, upstream. Um, so Jason walked off the slide to the left here. Okay, We didn't know that. All right, Cut to the chase. We all end up going back to the main tent at 7 p.m. That's when everybody's supposed to gather for mealtime. And I'm making dinner, and I see Ted making dinner. I'm like, hey, Ted, did you see uh, Jason? He's like, no, I didn't see Jason. Did you see Jason? I said, I just asked you that question. Back and forth, he's like, no, Jason. Oh, my gosh. I mean, this is really scary, because he's like, you know, you lose a college student. That's not a good thing. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, just think about the paperwork that you got to do. I mean, anyway, it was, no, we were actually quite, uh, quite nervous about it. But then, not for long, though, because then all of a sudden, we hear pitter-patter outside the tent. Zipper opens up. You see Jason's head poking through the tent. He's like, I found it. I found it. I said, what'd you find, Jason? What'd you find? Polar bear? What? What? He like, was like shaking. He's like, I got it. And he starts pulling out of his parka fish bones of lungfish, of scales, of plates, of, whoa, uh, everything. So what happened here was this. Jason walked off this slide. Okay, and did something, he was looking around. Then he started to walk back to camp. Now camp was to the right here, okay? About a mile to the right. And so what he did is, and walking back, he walked over this gray patch right here, right there, that gray patch. You know why it's gray? It's gray because it's a carpet of broken fish bones. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them. That's what stopped him, that's why he was late. So that he ran back to camp, then we, you know, since it's daylight 24 hours a day, we grabbed cliff bars, chocolate bars, or whatever, ran back to Jason's site, and this is us at two in the morning, crawling Jason's site, um, crawling his site, looking for where the bones are weathering out. And that wasn't a trivial exercise. That took us a long time to do. It took us another season. So eventually, we found, um, we found the layer that Jason's bones were coming from. There's Ted right there. Um, and you could see here's the layer right here. You know what? That layer that was producing those thousands of fragments of fish bones, they were there because there was a layer inside the rock that had skeleton after skeleton of fossil fish piled one on top of the other. And as, that weathered, as the rock weathered on surface, it would create these fragments. So now we had this layer which had skeletons. So we started to work that. We opened up a very big hole. This is the hole here as it looked in 2006. Right there, you could see a person there in white for scale. And so what we did is, you know, it's, it, it's an area about half the length of this stage. And what we did is we lined up every season next to each other, and we'd quarry these rocks, splitting the rocks and seeing skeletons of fish. And some were cool, some weren't cool, but none of them were anything I would talk to you about today, they were like lungfish and things like that, which we knew about from other places. Then everything changed one day when my colleague Steve Gates, see, sorry Steve, you're right off the slide here, but anyway, he cracked a rock from this spot right there where my pointer is, you can see it. And he said, hey guys, what's this? Literally, as soon as I saw that, I knew we had found what we had spent almost a decade and lots of money and lots of sprained ankles looking for. I had a fish skull looking out at me, and not just any fish skull, the skull of a flat-headed fish. Remember conical to flat? Here I had a flat-headed fish just peering right at me. So right here, I saw this. I'll show, this will make sense to you in a second. There's one jaw. It's upside down. There's another jaw. There were teeth in there. It was perfect. We were so excited. So Steve then etched this out into sort of a beautiful master stroke. And then um, we covered it in plaster. As we did that, we found four more of these fish to remove that season. They came back, they come back on the bottom of a helicopter wrapped in the plaster. There it is there. There's a first year graduate student for scale. Um, and, uh, uh, and then you know, they come back to the laboratory where the preparators remove the rock grain by grain to expose the fossils inside. Here's, let's follow Steve's specimen over a year, OK? After about five months, they remove the rock grain by grain. What do you have? Look at this. Looks like you have a top of the head, doesn't it? 
There's one orbit or eye hole. There's another orbit or eye hole. Looks like you have a flat head with eyes on top. Another few months go by. Look, check it out. Flat head, eyes on top. Look at this. There's one shoulder. There's another shoulder. It looks like you might even have a neck on this thing. What's exposing here? Remember what's the general rule? We were looking for a flat-headed fish with fins, with arm bones inside. We went to places in the world that have a place in the world that had rocks the right age, rocks the right type. We made the prediction. We had the exposures, and we found a flat-headed fish with fins with arm bones inside. This is it. If I was to hold it in front of you, in fact, I will hold it in front of you. I have brought a cast of a skull. Is that um, cast of it? Um, so it gives you a sense of the scale of the thing. You could hold this afterwards if you want to check it out. Come on up. Um, the, um, uh, but you can see it has an orbits, flat head, and so forth. But I was to, if I was to hold this thing in front of you, what would you see? You'd see it's like a fish. It has scales in its back. It has fins with fin webbing. But if you look at the bones, it has fishy texture for the, for the skull. This is kind of, this, this kind of texture. It's very fishy. Um, but it has a flat head with eyes on top. It has paired nostrils on either side. It has a neck, and when you crack open the fin, what do you see? Bones that correspond to upper arm, forearm, even part of a wrist inside of a fish. So just to go back a little bit, I know you thought I was crazy. I know you did. You were very, very polite when I did this. You were extremely polite, so thank you. But um, this V here I was pointing at, and I was like saying, oh, it's amazing, it's great, it's great, it's great. That's what it was, right, like that. So this is what we had sticking out of this, like, like that. That's what I saw for the first time. So I knew it was flathead, like that, upside down. Um, put it next to Roy here. Um, <laughs> so what we found, and we found since found like 20 of these uh, specimens, um, is what we have is, is a creature. And now we have many more of them, and, and they're known from other places in the world, too, that other teams have found. Um, this creature has fins with fin rays, has scales, have primitive jaws. It's very fishy in a lot of ways, but like a land living animal, has a neck, it has wrists, it has flat head, expanded ribs. It's a real mix of characters. Now, as the discoverers of this new creature, just like every scientist who finds a new species, we got to name it. And this was very important to us, the naming uh, exercise, because we were in the Canadian Arctic working at the pleasure of the Inuit communities, of the indigenous communities. And we've enga we engaged them from early on in our enterprise, bringing the youth with us. And we really thought it's important for them to be part of the announcement of the discovery, because it was on their land, and it's their traditions that helped us find it, honestly. So um, we had a naming project with the Inuit Committee of Elders. So this is the Inuit Council of Elders, as it was in 2005, when we were coming up with the name. And so we worked with these folks. And we had, the, the naming project had two goals. Goal number one was to come up with a name that was meaningful to the Inuit community and meaningful to us. And the second was that we had to come up with a name that we could pronounce. Um, <laughs> the name of the committee didn't lend me a whole lot of confidence that we'd come up with a <laughs> name that we could pronounce. It was, these were challenging. These were both kind of challenging. In fact, the, the former was actually really challenging because they didn't have any concept for fossils. So when we said, you know, where'd you find it? I said, well, you know, in the rocks up in Bird Fjord. It's like, fishermen don't hunt in rocks. It's like, oh, right, it's a fossil, and we had to go with that. So we went back and forth for a, quite a bit of time. Then they were like, well, this thing's really valuable, isn't it? It's worth a lot of money. I said, no, 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 we're scientists. We're not interested in money. And he's like, they thought I was crazy. And so it was like, we were going back and forth, and this gentleman was the leader. Um, he said, just tell me what it is and where it lives. I said, well, it's a large freshwater fish. He said, why don't you say so? You got yourself a tiktaalik. I said, a tiktaalik, what's that? He says, a large freshwater fish in our language, <laughs> in a nook and nook so, so it's the truth. And he came up with a second, um, a second name we couldn't pronounce. This Tiktaalik stuck. Now, we've since worked on this with new CT technology. You can see here's the fin. There's the fin. There's the fin rays. But inside it, you have a humerus with giant muscle scars. You have a radius, an ulna, upper arm, forearm, and a wrist. If you look at the shoulder, here is the shoulder of this fish. There's the humerus. There's a ball on the humerus. There's a socket on the shoulder. Really cool. There's the elbow of a fish. You know, you can see the radius and all know where the elbow is. And you have two wrist joints, just like amphibians have a proximal carpal and a distal carpal. So here you have, in um, Tiktaalik, you have a creature that is aquatic, lives in the water column, lives in the shallows, can even venture on land. It has, um, it has fins with arm bones inside. Um, it has a neck. Uh, it has lungs and gills. It's a real mix. And you know, I can go on and on about this transition from life in water to life on land. It's a, just a beautiful thing. But the important fact here, one of them I should say, 
is that this transition in the fossil record is not just some esoteric event in evolutionary past. It's inside our bodies. That is, this arm we see for the first time in Tiktaalik and its evolutionary cousins. What you see is this arm you can trace from Tiktaalik to amphibians to reptiles to mammals to people. You can trace the radius and ulna from Tiktaalik all the way through. We can do this with fossils. We can trace the neck, which I'm not showing you, all the way from Tiktaalik and its cousins all the way to us. We see it for the first time in these 